All right, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and uh, please get your Bible out today and turn with me to John chapter 9. That's what we'll be doing today, uh, verse by verse in the book of John. I've been enjoying our verse by verse through the book of John, and I hope you have as well. There's a lot to get into. Last time we finished up chapter 8, and we got it all done in, in one video. That's exciting. So today we'll probably finish chapter 9, and hopefully next time we'll finish chapter 10. We'll start going fast through here, because when we get done with this, the idea is to study the book of Revelation. And I'm looking forward to that, and I know many people are as well. They've told me, Brother Breaker, I really want to go through the book of Revelation verse by verse. So, okay, Lord willing, we'll get to that. So we'll start today in chapter 9, but before we do... I want you to see that the book of John is a book of many comparisons. And it's amazing to me the comparisons. And what we have been reading, what we're going to read again, is a comparison between spiritual blindness and physical blindness. But as we go through this book of John, it is a literary work of genius. I mean, I know the Holy Spirit wrote the book, but man, uh, maybe he used a little bit of John as he did it, because uh, this book is, is just amazing. It's a literary work of genius to see the comparisons. It starts out in chapter 1 with Jesus as God. And so he says Jesus is God, then he says Jesus is the Lamb. So it's going through and it's telling you all the things that Jesus is, but it's also comparing some things. Jesus as God, but Jesus also as man who came to do the sacrifice for sins. Chapter 2 ends with a man. Look at chapter 2, John chapter 2, the end of chapter 2. And it says, And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew that he was a man. Then chapter 3 starts out, there was a man. So man, man. Well, which man was that? Which man was that? It's, it, there's, if you read through John, you'll see these things, is what I'm trying to point out, and how amazing it is. And if you study to be a writer, they teach you these things. Um, chapter 3 talks about you must be born again. So it starts out with a man, you know, uh, Nicodemus, and Jesus says, you must be born again. But the comparison is, man needs to be born again. How? Through Jesus, who was born as man. And so that's all in the same chapter. It's incredible. Chapter 4 starts out with a woman at a well. And there's a woman at a well thirsting for water. And then you read the rest of the chapter. It says Jesus is the water. So he is the well that you're supposed to go to to get the spiritual water. Do you see that there? Do you see how it's one thing and the other, and yet one is physical, one is spiritual? It's amazing. It's amazing. This had to have been God that wrote this book. Chapter 5, verse 1, Jesus walks to Jerusalem. And what does he do in, in Jerusalem? He finds a guy that can't walk and then heals him so he can walk. <laughs> Do you see the comparison? I mean, as you go through the book, the more I read it, the more I get. And the more I go, wow, what a work of literary genius. In John chapter 6, he feeds the 5,000. But then he tells them that he is the true bread that they should eat. Eat spiritually by believing in him. So, what an amazing, amazing, amazing thing that this is, that... He feeds the 5,000 physical bread, but then he says, I am the spiritual bread. Then you get to chapter 7. Now, chapter 7, you look at uh, something that's quite interesting. They talk about Moses. Well, you think about Moses. Moses gives Israel the, the victory and, and deliverance from Pharaoh by crossing a body of water, crossing the Red Sea. Well, then Jesus tells them, hey, I am the water of life. So he's giving them all these Old Testament things to think about, and then he's saying, now that was about me. So it's just incredible. John chapter 8, there's a woman in adultery. But who are the men who are the adulterers? We find out it's the Pharisees that were spiritual adulterers when it came to not following God. And then um, we see also that Jesus says he is the light in John chapter 8 and verse 12. So when do you commit adultery? Usually in darkness. You don't want to do it out in the open. You always go to a dark place, don't you? And Jesus is saying, but I'm the light. I am the light. Then we go to um, chapter 9. Now chapter 8 ends with Jesus basically telling the Pharisees, you're blind and you can't see. <laughs> you're spiritually blind. Now chapter 9 begins with Jesus saying, okay, now let me heal this guy that's blind. 
So do you see that? As you're going through, there's this and this and this and this and this and this. And it's just incredible. It's just incredible how one is physical, the other is spiritual. So Jesus is clearly showing you through the physical world spiritual lessons that you're to know. So let's start in John chapter 9 and let's go to verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, oh I love that song. There's a song about how Jesus passed by. And that's a wonderful song. Um, oh what a change in my life when Jesus passed by. I don't remember all the words and everything but that's a great song. So Jesus passed by. Now what was he passing by? Well, look at the verse before in the end of chapter 8, verse 59. Going through the midst of them, and so passed by. 9-1. And Jesus passed by. Passed by, passed by. It's, it's interesting. So Jesus passed by and saw a man which was blind from his birth. So this man was born blind. Now, Jesus passes by. Now, why was Jesus passing by? Well, he's fleeing from those in verse 29 that want to kill him, stone him to death. And now he's passing through the midst of them. But then he takes time to stop because he wants to help people. So Jesus will pass by those that don't want truth. If someone is not serious about God and the Bible and truth and salvation, God will pass by them and go, No, nah, okay, you don't want to be saved? Fine. But those that are seeking, it seems like God is willing to, to come to. And so that's why it's important. I believe that's in Hebrews. It's a, he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. So you need to seek after God. Now, Jesus passed by. So as And it starts out, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now what a strange question. They want to know, why was he blind? Because of his sin? Well, how could it have been his sin if he hadn't been born yet? Or was it his parents' sin? Maybe his parents' sin. Now, we know that there are some sexual sins that if you do in this life, it can lead to your child being born blind. Was it syphilis or gonorrhea or things like that? It can lead to birth defects. So they're asking maybe, you know... Um, is it because of the sins of the parents that this child was born blind? Now we're going to get into this, but before we do, let me back up. There are several places in the Bible where God heals someone who is blind. And we find a healing of the blind in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just as we find the feeding of the 5,000 in all four of the Gospels. So it seems like when John wrote the book of John, he's writing the most important miracles. And he's writing with a purpose to show you, and I think it's blatantly obvious, that, hey, you're spiritually blind. And just like this guy was physically blind and needed to be healed, you are spiritually blind and you need to be healed. And when you're blind, what is it that you don't see? You don't see light. So what do you need? You need Jesus to heal you of your blindness so you can see the light. And by the way, Paul calls the gospel the light of the gospel. <laughs> Isn't that something? So, in the spirit world, what is it that's light? The gospel. That's all about Jesus, who is the light. But let me show you really quickly these different times that someone is healed of blindness by Jesus. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 27. Matthew 9, 27, we read this. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. And when Jesus departed hence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come unto the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. So here is two men that Jesus heals. Now let's go over to Mark, Mark chapter 8. So Jesus is able to heal blind people in his earthly ministry, and he did. But he's also able to heal the blind in the world today that are spiritually blind to the truth. And they need to come to the light to be healed. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. Mark 8, 22, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town, and when he had spit upon his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. 
After that he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he saw and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. Okay, now Luke 18. So we're seeing that in four gospels they record this. Hmm. Is it the same men? Well, there's one time it was two two different guys. So it sounds like it's it's different ones. So Jesus did a lot of miracles. Luke chapter 18, verse 35. Luke 18, 35. And it came to pass, as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glory in God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. So now go back to John chapter 9. And let's go ahead and read verse 6 and 7. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind with the clay. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. So when he washed, then he could see. So we see four different um, gospels and four different accounts of Jesus healing blind people. So Jesus healed the blind. Now, go back to chapter 9 and verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answers. Okay. Now, there's three theories here about this. One, the parents sinned. Two, that the boy sinned. Well, wait a minute. Did, did the man sin in his parents' belly? Because he came out blind. It wasn't after he was born he did a sin that made him blind. So that that is really a weird question. <laughs> kind of a dumb question, right? Or could it be, like three theories, parents sin, the man himself sins, or maybe bad things just happen to good people. Sometimes in this world there are people that are born blind. And it's not their sin, it's not the parents' sin. It just happens. And sometimes that happens. Now, some people say, well, you forgot reincarnation. Maybe in another life he was bad, and that's what. Was that what they were asking? Were they asking that because they believed in reincarnation? I don't think so. If you know your Bible, they believed in one God and one resurrection. They didn't believe in reincarnation. And in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, Paul reiterates that and tells us there's no such thing as reincarnation according to the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So one time you get to live. You don't get reincarnated and live again and live again and again and again. That's not a biblical teaching. That's not what the Bible says. So they're asking this question, and the question is, did he sin or did his parents sin? What a weird question. Was he blind because he sinned? How could he sin if he wasn't born did he sin in his mother's belly somehow i mean that that's just an odd question verse 3 jesus answered neither have this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of god should be made manifest in him so jesus says here's why he was born blind because i before the foundation of the world knew that i was going to be here at this time and i wanted to do a miracle and so i allowed that man to be born blind so god let that happen to him now, a lot of people in the world today say, I can't believe in a God that lets things like that happen. Well, I'm sorry, but things like that do happen. But do you know what God also allowed? Him to be miraculously healed so that for the rest of the life of that man, he can go around and say, I was the blind man that was healed by Jesus. Wow. So God didn't do him wrong by allowing him to be born blind. He was something that was to take place according to God's plan so that something great could happen to him. Okay, God is a God of grace and mercy and love. And so don't think God is evil. You know, some people say, God is so bad. No, he's not. Now, Jesus says, so that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, 
That's a picture of the church age. There's several times in the book of John where Jesus says something that is not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it makes you think that Jesus kind of said it like this to John. I must do this before night comes. And these are things that John remembered. And after Paul comes out with his revelations, he's like, I remember Jesus revealed that to me too. I better write my book and include those little things that Jesus told me because I want people to be remembered of them. And so this is a veil, uh, a picture of the church age. And the church age is like this. Well, if you know the Jewish day, the Jewish day starts with night. And so you've got the evening, midnight, cock crowing, early morning. And then that's the end. Then it starts the day. So Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. So Jesus dies on the cross, and then that starts the evening, and the church age is waiting for the day. Jesus is the day star. So he comes back and takes us up as the day star. So there's a lot more I could get into there as a picture, but I, I don't have time if we're going to get through this book. But verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus Christ says, I am the light. Now we're going to get into that. We're going to show you some more about Jesus being the light. There's a lot to get into in this, so I can't wait. But let's continue. Verse 6, when he had thus spoken, he sped on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now why on earth would Jesus spit and make clay, and it kind of sounds a little vulgar and gross, doesn't it? Makes me wonder, did the man even have any eyeballs? There were some people in this world that are born without even an eye socket, and the skin just grows across. Like one-eyed Willie. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, if you ever saw Goonies as a kid, and I did, old one-eyed Willie, okay? Even the bone underneath the skin had grown across, and he probably was born without one eye. So that was my thought. Or did he have eyes and they just didn't work? Either way, Jesus spits in clay and rubs clay in his, in his eyes. Now, why did he do this? I have no idea. But Jesus is God, and God can heal people any way he wants. And maybe he did this just to show you that he can do it however he wants to do it. But this is the way that God chose to do it. And I think it's a picture that he is the creator because when God created man, what did he create them of? Dust, clay. Let's look at some verses. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. We are made of dust. So I think Jesus is trying to show them, hey, I am the one who created you to begin with out of the dust. And I can still do it. And they were supposed to see that and believe, oh, that is the great Jehovah, creator of all. Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So, we came from dust. And that is also found in the book of Job. In the book of Job. God created us from the dirt, and made this body, and it goes back to the dirt when it dies. And uh, that's what the Bible says. From dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. Over in the book of Job, chapter 10 and verse 9. Job 10, 9 says this, Remember I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again? Job 13, 12. Your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay. So that was Job 13, 12. So the Bible clearly tells us that we come from dust, or dirt, or clay. Now, Jesus did that, and now look what he says in verse 7. Back to John chapter 9 and verse 7. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, or Siol, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Siloam, Siloam, of Siloam, which is by interpretation, sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came, seeing. Now, I'm going to draw you up here a map real quick. I don't want to take too much time with this. I'm not the best of map drawers. So let me draw up here a map, and over here we have what we called, remember last time when we saw, this is the Mount of Olives. And down here, all this is the Kidron Valley. Now, in the beginning of the book of John, there was a guy who was uh, crippled, and he was waiting at a certain pool for an angel to come and heal him. 
that was a different pool. And I'm going to try to point out some of these pools. And maybe your um, Bible has a uh, map in the back. And you can try to locate these things. I love to use my little map in the back of my Bible and see what, uh, what it shows. So there was a pool up here called the Pool of Bethsaida. That's the Pool of Bethsaida. Excuse me. Bethsaida. So that's the Pool of Bethsaida. And we see that in, was it chapter 5? I think it was chapter 5. John chapter 5 at the beginning. And it, and it was the sheep market, a pool, which in the Hebrew tongue is Bethesda. So I said Bethesda, Bethesda, Bethesda. i got to say that right, Bethesda, Bethesda, I'm missing an E here, Bethesda. So this was the pool of Bethesda. So Jesus does a miracle at this pool, okay? There's another pool around here, and that's called the Israel pool. Now I'm, I'm pointing this out because... Jerusalem is in the middle of a desert. If you're in a desert, you're thirsty, and you want water. And all over Jerusalem, there's water. Down here is what's called the Gihon Spring. That's the Gihon Spring. And so Jesus was up here, this little area here, we call this the City of David. And so Jesus did a miracle up here at this place, but this time Jesus is down here and he's talking to this guy and over in this area here is the pool of Siloam. So this is the pool. Now there's another pool down here and that little pool is called the lower pool. So there are a lot of places for a person to bathe. A lot of places for a person to go and wash over there. But this story here that we're looking at is Jesus talking to a man who's blind who takes clay and spits in his eyes and says, now go wash in this pool. So you've got this pool in chapter 9, this pool in chapter 5. Why does it seem like they're always around pools? Because they're in the middle of the desert and they're getting thirsty and you want to refresh yourself with some water because it's hot. I've never been to Israel, but I hear it's pretty, pretty hot over there. So, Jesus Christ told him to go and wash. He did, and it seems that when he came back, he came seeing. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit leading a sinner to water. Now, the water is the Word. The Bible talks about the Bible as the Word of God, but it also is talked about as water. And leading them to the water of the word and having the eyes of their understanding enlightened. Go to um, Ephesians chapter 1. The word of God is like light, and the word of God is like water. So Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So there is some understanding that you must have. And there are some spiritual eyes, if you will, in your heart. And the Bible talks about seeing with your heart and understanding with your heart. Now, I don't understand that. But it has to do with spiritual sight. So we have physical sight, and we can see physically. But when it comes to salvation, there is something you have to see spiritually before you can get saved, and that's through faith that you're saved. But there must be a spiritual awakening, a spiritual understanding of something. There's something you must know before you get saved. So back to John chapter 9, and verse 7, here's what we're seeing. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore, and washed, and came singing. So again, it's a type of the Holy Spirit leading the sinner to the water, the Word of God, and having his eyes of understanding enlightened, and now he sees. But so Jesus is over here. He was in the temple. He comes out of the temple. He must be going down this way. And all this must be taking place somewhere down here. He could have said, go wash in the Gihon Spring. He could have said, go wash in the Lower Spring. But probably it was the closest one. So he said, go to the pool of Siloam. And he did. And he obeyed God. And what a thing. He came seeing. Now verse 8. The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. 
he perks up and he says, yeah, yeah, I was that guy. I was the blind guy. Now look at verse 10. They ask a question. What? You're, you're not the same guy. There's something different about you. It's a picture of salvation. How do we get saved? Through hearing of the Word of God and understanding and believing. Got to see something before you can get saved. Got to hear something before you can get saved. So there's something different about them. So they're like, what happened? Well, here is a perfect example of witnessing. Anyone can witness. Just tell the facts. Verse 10, Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? How is it that you see now? Who opened your eyes? How did that take place? Because you were blind before. Like I said, I wonder if he didn't even have eyes. Because, you know, otherwise he would have looked exactly the same, but now he's just walking around seeing everything. So it almost makes me think that he was born without eye sockets and there was just skin over the top. Now, I don't know. I don't know. But there's something that when they saw him, they said, N Is that? No. Okay? And then verse 11, he answered. So he is witnessing to them now. He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. So maybe he did have eyes, but they just didn't work. I don't know. But there was something about him they could tell was different. Maybe he wasn't going around with his cane like this. Maybe he was going around just walking, going, man, this is great. He'd probably going around going, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. You know, because he never seen before. Now he's probably seen it all trying to take it in. So he just tells the facts and tells what happened to him. He tells exactly what happened. That's what witnessing is. People say, I'm a Christian, but I don't know how to witness. Just tell people how you got saved, and maybe they'll get saved too. Then said they unto him, where is he? He said, I know not. Where's who? Where's Jesus? Because they're like, wow, if he can heal you, maybe he can do something for me. Where is he? He says, I don't know. Verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Now remember this. This is important. This all took place on the Sabbath, a day of rest. The Pharisees are going to accuse Jesus of doing evil. When Jesus did this great miracle, the Pharisees are going to say, you did wrong because you did it on the Sabbath day. <laughs> and so they're going to accuse Jesus of sin. When all Jesus did was help a man and heal his blindness. That's how evil the Pharisees were. They only looked for the bad. They never looked for the good. A lot of people out there today that are Pharisees. And they never look at the whole picture and the good that comes out of it. They're always nitpicking to find the little thing that's bad. I try to look at the good. Yes, there's a lot of bad in this world, but I try to find the good. Because if you live your life just looking for the bad and you don't recognize the good, you're going to be miserable. That's not a life to live. Look for the good. So they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind, verse 13, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Okay, so this happened on the Sabbath day. Verse 15, then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes and I washed and do see. All facts, all things that happened. He's witnessing to the lost Pharisees. <laughs> Therefore it said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Hmm. They're talking about Jesus. And they said, Jesus isn't keeping the Sabbath. What an evil man. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? Other who? Some of the Pharisees are talking. So some of the Pharisees said, How can he do that, that sinner? They want to believe that Jesus was a sinner. And they said, how, the, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was division among them. Now, was Jesus a sinner? No. So again, they're wrong. But it caused division. And they started to go, well, maybe I should get away from the Pharisees. And maybe, remember last time in the chapter before where some of the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, are we all so blind too? Remember that? Some of the Pharisees are starting to wake up and realize, oh, I am in a false religion. I am in a religion that's supposed to be following the true God and the true law. But we are not even recognizing the one that was sent by the law. And what it says, we, we're in trouble. Verse 17, They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now he gives his opinion. I think that guy's a prophet. I think he has to be a prophet because he healed me. Well, the Pharisees did not believe, and they're getting upset. Now watch this. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had 
been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. Now, wait a minute. These Jews, these, these Pharisees would not believe that this blind man was blind. But a lot of the people that n knew him recognized him. Because he was probably, I don't know, maybe he was out in front of the temple, maybe he was somewhere else, but somewhere where there was a road, blind people sit by the side of the road like this. Because they can't work, they sit there and they beg. And if you were walking down that road every day of your life, you would have seen the same guy in the same spot, and you would have recognized him. Well, I guess the Pharisees were too good to help out the poor people. That's what they were supposed to be doing. If they walked by, they must have looked the other way. They must have been such evil, prideful, hateful, wicked people that they thought, I'm better than that blind guy. I'm not going to even look at him. So they didn't even recognize him. But other people recognized who he was. Why didn't the Pharisees recognize him? That's interesting. I've seen this in other countries. I remember going to Guadalajara in Mexico a couple years ago and seeing these beggars out in front of the Catholic Church begging for money, and some of them were blind. And I just thought to myself, Where's the Catholic priest? <laughs> Why isn't he coming out and giving them money? He's probably living it up in the back room with all the money he's getting in the offering, huh? Modern day Pharisees? I mean, why aren't you helping the people that need the most help? That's interesting. So they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now they get upset. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. Now verse 19. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son whom you say was born blind? Listen to what they say. Whom you say was blind? Now we don't know. We don't think he was. But you say, is this the one that you say is blind? Do you see the bias these Pharisees have? They don't want to believe a miracle of God. Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? The parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. So they confess, Yes, this was our child who was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Now, the next verse, verse 22, tells us that they were afraid. They had fear of the Pharisees. So out of fear, they spoke the way they did. The Pharisees were so evil that they browbeated the people and put the people down. They were extortionists. Jesus has taxed them in Matthew chapter 23 and tells you how evil they are. So look what it says in verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Excommunication. Shipping them. <laughs> kicking them out. Saying, you can't be here. You can't believe that Jesus is the Christ. If you do, well, you're not allowed to come back to the temple. While we are in charge here, the Pharisees were abusing their power. That is scary and that is sad. So the parents of the blind guy were afraid to even answer. They didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. But they had to tell the truth. And the truth was, that's our son, and we don't know how this happened. So you ask him. And so they did. They said, okay. Verse 23, therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Verse 24, then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, this is what, the third time they're asking him? They don't want to believe, so they keep asking. They remind me of a lawyer. And remember in the Bible, the Pharisees were, were lawyers as well. They're supposed to know their law. They remind me of lawyers up on the stand trying to badger a witness and belligerent him, you know. When were you there? Were you there? Why don't you tell the court you were here? Weren't you here? Where were you? Were you there? I mean, it's like, uh, objection, badgering the witness. <laughs> That's what they were doing. They're badgering the witness because they didn't want to believe what he said. So, verse 24, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. They said, say God healed you, not the man. Because if it was the man, the man must be God? Is that the line of reasoning there? Is that the thought? I mean, to believe that would have to be that you believe that Jesus is God? Or at least a prophet of God? Verse 25, he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. 
Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? They asked him again the same question. Well, if I was him, I'd be starting to get angry. I'd be like, dudes, are you that dumb? You've asked me this three or four times already. Can't you accept the answer? Verse 27, he answered them, I have told you already. <laughs> All right, and now it says, I have told you already. But I like to read it like this. I've told you already, okay? Come on, I said so already. Are you listening? No, because many of the Pharisees didn't want to hear the truth. Now let me back up real quick before we continue. i got to back up to verse 24. We know that this man is a sinner. They lie. They're calling him a sinner. They don't want to believe him, so they want him to be a, a sinner. Now why would they claim that Jesus was a sinner? Because he healed them on the Sabbath day. And for a Jew to break the Sabbath is a sin. So they are saying, oh, you were healed? Okay, so in a way they're admitting that he was healed. But they're thinking, but that's not good because we hate him. So how can we take something good, turn it into bad? Okay, well, he did it on the Sabbath day, so he's a Sabbath breaker. So that's sin. So he's a sinner. So they're looking for any excuse to nitpick Jesus. And the good that he did, they don't care. They want to make it into something bad. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Those Pharisees, man, are a piece of work. They cannot see the good and believe the truth. They can only nitpick and point out some little tiny thing and turn it into something and then name call. You're a sinner. That's all they know how to do is name call. They have no charity, no grace whatsoever. Are there Pharisees like that today? Well, I won't go there, but you know there are. There are a lot of them out there like that today. The same MO, right? Modus operandi. The same thing. That's what they do. They can't take the good nitpick, pull something out, and then attack you and call you names. And you just wait to see what they do to Jesus. They keep on name calling. It's so sad. They're Pharisees. And uh, look what it says. It says, um, they claim he was a sinner because what he did, he did on the Sabbath day. And they said he's breaking the Sabbath. Well, they got a point though, right? Shouldn't we look at what they say? I mean, on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to do certain things. But in the law, does it say you can't heal on the Sabbath? No, it doesn't. And uh, were they still under the law <laughs> right then? Here's Jesus Christ. Here's the Old Testament law. Now, go with me to Luke chapter 16 and verse 16. Luke 16, 16, And the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. So John the Baptist shows up. And then we have this little time that's Jesus' ministry. And guess what? Different dispensation. Or maybe I'll say it like this, a, a transition period to a new dispensation, which we call the church age. And when the church age got started, there was a little bit of a transition period. So was Jesus a sinner? The Pharisees said he sinned by doing something on the Sabbath, and that is against the law. Well, they're right. So I guess Jesus is a sinner? Well, if you don't read the Bible, you would come to that conclusion. But if you read the rest of the Bible, the Bible clearly says the law and the prophets were to John. So when Jesus showed up, he began a transition from the law to grace. From Israel to the church. So there are dispensations in the Bible. And these people that don't believe in dispensations, you got a problem then the Pharisees were right, and Jesus is a sinner. If there's no such thing as dispensations. Otherwise, there must be dispensations, because the law and the prophets were to John. Now we're starting a new dispensation, or actually a transition to a new dispensation, and now Jesus could do something like he did, heal someone on the Sabbath, and not be breaking the law, and not be a sinner. Because it was a transition of something that was prophesied to come. Okay? I want you to see that, because some people will go to the Bible and take verses like this and say, so Jesus was a sinner, so when he died on the cross and shed his blood, he was just a sinner dying, so it's no good for you. No, the Bible says he was sinless. So God in heaven did not count Jesus healing a blind man as a sin. God the Father looked at it as the work of the Father, and that it was the work that Jesus did to prove to them who he was. So I want you to get a hold of that, all right? There are a lot of people that will go to verses and twist them out of context and try to say, see, Jesus is a sinner. No, the Pharisees said he was a sinner. But they're known liars, so we don't listen to them. 
And we read the rest of the Bible, we see, oh, it's a transition to a new dispensation. That makes sense. Now, with that said, Jesus is doing what he's doing, and he's doing a good thing, healing people, doing wonderful things. But uh, the question arises, are we under the law today? Well, there are people out there that are just as bad as the Pharisees, who today try to say we're still under the law. Many of those are your Seventh-day Adventists. And many Seventh-day Adventists tell people, we're still under the law, we're still under the law today. Then Jesus is a sinner. Is that what you're telling me? Because he broke the Sabbath. And you say we shouldn't break the Sabbath or we're sinning. No, we're no longer under the law according to the Scriptures. Do you even read your Bible? Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Read that again. For you are not under the law. So we're not under the law. Not anymore. It changed. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So we are not saved by the law. Go to Galatians chapter 3. I just get so tired of getting into debates with these people. And they come along and they think they're so smart. No, we're still under the law. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I keep the law. I keep the law. And my first question is, really? You keep the law? So when did you get circumcised? And they say, duh. Because they can't answer that because they've never been circumcised. Now, if you want me to get a pair of scissors and you want to be circumcised, I'll help you with that. I don't want to do that. I cringe to think about that. But that's what puts you under the law. So you're not even under the law until you're circumcised. So what are you doing trying to get people back under the law when the Bible says we're not under the law? Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Galatians 3, 24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now verse 25. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So the law is the schoolmaster. We're no longer under the schoolmaster. We're no longer under the law once we find Christ. But many of your Seventh-day Adventists today, they talk about the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath. And they say, we've got to keep the Sabbath. Well, for those that don't know, the Sabbath is Saturday. The first day is Sunday. Look at any calendar. And many of your Seventh-day Adventists say, we are still under the Old Testament law, and we still have to keep the Sabbath. And I just laugh. I cannot understand how anyone can be so blatantly ignorant and can say such a silly and ridiculous thing. All I see is someone who has confessed to me, I've never read my Bible. Because if you read the Bible, and you look at the verses we just looked at, the Bible says we're not under the law. So we do not keep the Sabbath today because that was part of the law. But they say, no, we do keep the Sabbath, and you're wrong, Mr. Breaker. Okay, I will listen to your argument, and I will take you to the Scripture. You are one of those seven days. I get phone calls. I get emails from people still. you got to keep the Sabbath. you got to keep the Sabbath. They're so dogmatic. And you know what? They aren't even keeping the Sabbath. And I'm going to show you that here in a second. But if we have to keep the Sabbath today, we have a great big problem. Let's go to the law, Exodus chapter 31. And let's read verse 12 through 18. Exodus 31, 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, ye is Israel, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So he says, This is my Sabbath for you. So the Sabbath is for Israel. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Uh-oh! <laughs> Capital punishment for not keeping the Sabbath. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Twice. The death penalty for not keeping the Sabbath. And you contact me with your little phone calls, your emails, with your letters in, in the mail, and say, Robert Breaker, you're a Sabbath breaker, and you're not even saved because you're not keeping the Sabbath. And I look at the Bible, and the Bible says we're no longer under the law. But you tell me we are, and I have to keep it. So I say, well, what does the Bible say about it? The Bible says capital punishment. That if I don't keep the law, and I don't keep the Sabbath, then you are to stone me to death and kill me. And I just go... Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh.
There must be dispensations. If there's no dispensations, then we're supposed to go and kill people that don't keep the Sabbath. Are you really, are you really telling me that you believe that that is for today and that we're supposed to do that? No. No, 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 no. We do not do that. If you do that and you kill someone, you deserve to go to jail. Because look what the rest of it says here. It is a sign. Verse 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. I'm not Israel, are you? No, you're not, if you're not a Jew. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, and in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with them upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So this is for Israel. Now let me show you one more verse here. I look at these Seventh-day Adventists today, many of them don't even know that they were founded by a man named Miller, who set a false date for the rapture. <laughs> and many of them don't know that Miller and the woman that helped him and these other people, they met in Battle Creek, Michigan, and they used to meet in the same asylum to hold their church meetings. What an interesting place to start a cult in an insane asylum. It was called a sanatorium. I've seen that place. Wow. You better be careful of any religion that starts in an insane asylum. Okay? That's all I'm saying. But look what it says in Exodus chapter 35. If you really believe that we have to keep the Sabbath, Exodus 35 says this. Exodus 35, 3. Exodus 35, 3 says, Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Alright? If you read your Old Testament and you want to follow the Old Testament, and you want to keep the Sabbath, number one, you have to kill people that don't keep it within your congregation. You better not do that. You better get a hold of dispensations and understand. Otherwise, you're going to go kill people, and that's wrong. But also, you are not supposed to start a fire on the Sabbath day. We drive by every time we go to church and, and come back, a gigantic Seventh-day Adventist church. And on Sunday, it's dead. Nobody's there. They meet on Saturday. And so sometimes on Saturdays we'll drive by and we'll see all these cars out there. And I just think to myself, what hypocrites. How sad. Do you know what a car is? A car uses a combustible engine. An engine makes fire. The gasoline. Have you ever seen an engine? And you've got all these pistons in there and what that does is called a combustible engine because there's a fire. And then that's why it has all this exhaust pipes going out and it goes out in the exhaust because that's the gas from the exhaust. Every time you start your car, you're kindling a fire. Turn that key, broom, you're starting a fire. And every time I drive by these Seventh-day Adventist churches in town and I see them there on Saturdays, I think to myself, I wish they'd read their Bible. They, they're a bunch of Sabbath breakers. They're not even keeping the Sabbath that they claim to be keeping. Because they all started their car, started a fire, to go there. And that's against Exodus 35.3. <laughs> wow. So now back to uh, John chapter 9. You ever think about these things? If you're going to be under the law, you better be under the law. But the Bible says we're not under the law, so why do you want to go there? John chapter 9. In verse 24. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He's like, oh, I've already told you. He answered them, I have told you already. Right? I've told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? I mean, you can tell this guy's getting angry. Like, why do you keep questioning me the same thing? It's an interrogation. It's the Spanish Inquisition. He's not giving them the answer they want to hear, so they keep interrogating him, hoping through intimidation to get a different answer. But he just finally said enough with it. He said, what, are, are you his disciples or something? Are you followers of him? Is that why you're asking? Oh, they're like, no, how dare you? We, they hate Jesus. They don't want to be called a follower of Jesus. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We keep the law. And they weren't keeping the law. 
We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. <laughs> whence is from is the word where. Um, whence in Old English. So we don't know where he's from. But is that is that true? Did they not know where he was from? I mean, let's go back to John chapter 8 and verse 23, okay? John chapter 8 and verse 23. Jesus is speaking, and he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. If they had listened to Jesus, they would have known where he's from. He told them already, I'm from above. But yet they lie. We don't know where he's from. Yeah, they did. They knew he was from Bethlehem. So, why? Why did they lie? It seems like every other word out of the Pharisees' mouth was a lie. It's just so sad. And why? Why do they not? Because they're blind. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13 real quick. I'm going to show you this. Jesus is speaking, and when he's speaking, he's speaking and saying things, but he's not saying it as directly as he could. He's saying it, but he's also making correlation between physical and spiritual things. He's trying to teach, and he's saying it in such a way that they can't get it. And there's a reason for that. Matthew 13, 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Remember, they're spiritually blind. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah, or Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Now watch verse 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest that at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they shall see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So Jesus says the problem with the Pharisees is their ears are closed, their eyes are closed. They are blind, more blind than this blind man. And Jesus already told them in chapter 8, I'm from above, and they didn't hear it. It sounds like they just didn't get it. So they're lying because Jesus told them, but they're so blind, maybe they're not lying. Maybe they didn't understand it. They heard it, but didn't believe it. So in their mind, they're saying, no, no, we don't know where he's from, because they won't receive the testimony of Jesus himself. So Jesus heals a man, and now he's like, now you're going to listen to him and his testimony? <laughs> and it sounds like they don't want to hear his testimony. Now, verse 30. The man answered and said unto them, this is amazing, this is one of my favorite parts, because they're not accepting it. And the man goes, really? Well, then this is amazing because you say this, and this is what happened to me. And so, this and this and that. He just connects the dots to where they're like, duh. They can't say anything, so what do they do? They attack him. They attack him just like modern day Pharisees. All they can do is attack. They can't deal with truth. The man answered and said, verse 30, unto them, why, herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Wow, you don't know who he is, and you say he's a sinner, and you don't know where he's from, and yet he did a miracle of God and opened my eyes. And yet you're the religious leaders, and you don't even know how this happened. <laughs> Boy, he's putting them in their place. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners. Hmm, isn't that interesting? But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Okay, so it's like Paul says in Hebrews. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 32. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. So he says he must have been God. And here are you Pharisees that claim to be the priest class that were put here by God, and yet God comes and does a miracle. And you don't even know who it was that did it. And you won't even claim it was God. This is crazy. He's like starting to wonder, are you guys even of God? I mean, he's, he's wondering about them, if they're even right with God. Verse 34, they answered the Pharisees and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. That's a bastard, someone that's born in sin. So do you see the Pharisees? They don't go, well, you got a point there. Okay, well, go ahead and go on out. We'll think about this. They go, you bastard, shut up and get out. Do you see that? They're literally calling him a bastard because a bastard is, that's what they said to Jesus. You were all born in sin. They called Jesus a bastard. Pharisees 
will not deal with truth, and the first thing they'll do is attack you and name call you. Call you unsaved. And they'll even call you demon possessed. Hmm. We'll look at that here in a minute. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Boy, what a testimony, he says. Now verse 34, They answered and said unto him, Thou wast also together born in sins, and doth thou teach us? And they cast him out. They're like, you're going to teach us now? We're the learned lawyer class. We know the Bible. And you're, you're going to teach us? Well, obviously he was smarter than they were. Because they were dumb in their unbelief. And he saw a miracle. He said, you mean, I just, I just believe Jesus. I just believe that this guy must have been of God. Now, verse 35. Jesus heard that when they cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, several things about this. He's cast out of the temple, and he comes out of the temple, and Jesus finds him. Whew, I love that. And Jesus found him. Jesus found me on July 29, 1992. And I thank God he found me. I thank God I got saved. But Jesus found him. Look what it says. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him. So Jesus is the he that found him said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? So Jesus here refers to himself as the Son of God. New versions change this to the Son of Man. Why do they do that? If Jesus is the Son of God, the context of this is that he must be God in the flesh. That's the context of what we're going to read in this chapter and the next. But new versions change this to Son of Man. That is an attack on the deity of Christ. There's five times that new versions change Son of God to Son of Man. And it's all an attack on the deity of who Jesus is. Luke 23, 42, Acts 8, 37, Acts 9, verse 5 and 6, Acts 16, 31, and John 9, 35. Now that's just a note I have in my Bible. I haven't checked that. Check that for yourself and see if it's not true. If you're using a different Bible other than the King James, you're not using a pure Word of God. You're using a watered-down perversion of the Bible in which wicked men have changed words and it does attack the deity of Christ. And it's sad. I just want to throw that out there. But now with that said, Jesus says, Hey, do you believe on the Son of God? Verse 36, He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? I found that amazing. He finds Jesus and Jesus has healed him. He says, Lord, who is he? It looks like to me, by calling Jesus Lord, he's saying, I believe you're the Lord. <laughs> Already I believe the Lord. What does he say? Well, verse 37, And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen me, and it is he that talketh with thee. He's saying, I am the Son of God. And what is he saying? Because I'm the Son of God, my Father is God, so I am the Son of God. I am what? I am deity. So he's saying, I am God. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Verse 38. So a lot of stuff is going on here in this chapter. And we're almost done. Let's go ahead and finish this up. And Jesus said, verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come unto this world, that they which see not might see. And they which see might be blind. So Jesus says, I'm coming into this world for judgment against the Pharisees of them being evil. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? I think I said that was in the last chapter too, but it's, it's here. Are we blind also? Wow, what a great question. They're starting to see. Jesus is talking about spiritual things and physical things. They're starting to, oh, it's starting to click. So some of the Pharisees are starting to go the right way and depart from the evil ones who for no reason whatsoever will believe on Jesus. They choose to hate him. But some of the Pharisees are starting to see the truth, like Nicodemus, remember? Verse 41, Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. So Jesus is saying, You guys are the sinner. 
Now, what was the sin that just happened? They're trying to accuse Jesus of the sin of blasphemy when they are the ones that have just blasphemed Jesus and saying he's not of God when he is, he's the Son of God. I wonder if that's the sin that is specifically speaking of is their sin of saying that Jesus is not the Son of God. I don't know. All I know is this was an amazing chapter and there's so much going on here and it reminds me of today. When somebody is a Pharisee and it's so easy to figure out who a Pharisee is. A Pharisee is someone who is blind spiritually and does not see the truth. They usually preach false doctrine. They usually preach things that are wrong. They usually look at the big picture and instead of seeing the good in it, they only can find the bad. And then when you come to them with truth and try to explain to them, hey brother, the Bible says this. Hey man, maybe they're a brother in Christ, maybe they're not. Hey, this, this is this and this is this and you got this wrong. You need to get this right. They look at you and say, shut up. You're a sinner. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. And all they know how to do is name call and get angry and attack. Wow. I do not want to be a Pharisee. No thanks. I want to stay close to Jesus. And I want to be one that worships the Lord and praises the Lord and witnesses and tells others about Jesus and points people to the blood of Jesus Christ. Because that's the way of salvation. What Jesus did. All right, God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.